So when it comes to addiction, I think that's also important to like define. So like the little bit of reading and research that I've done on it is like the, the definitions vary vastly. And there's like the old school model that's like addiction is a disease and there's a gene and um, you're kind of this helpless participant not by your own by your own decision making it's just like you were predispositioned and you found yourself like an alcoholic or you found yourself a sex addict or whatever these things are and then a lot of the newer neuroscience is saying that it's not necessarily a disease that there's no gene that's kind of been like pinpointed and we say ah like this is the gene for alcoholic or for al- alcoholics this is the gene for someone who's going to be predispositioned to sex addiction or or what have you um it's more of like like habits that have formed and then these like these neuro pathways that are just kind of getting deeper and deeper and deeper and that's why you keep doing it so it's all the things that lead up to the the drink or the porn so it's like well what are your triggers for that um so i guess like do you would you say that you're which camp do you fall in as far as like disease or um not or more of a habit probably well i suppose it depends i would say with drugs and uh or listen substances and alcohol. I mean, the, the, the definition of addiction is repeated use of something in the face of negative consequences. And my understanding is usually there is a genetic component to it, Mm -hmm. but that's not to say just because something's biological or someone has a predisposition that they don't have some, uh, free, some will or say in terms of the decisions they make. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think with, when it comes to anything about sex or porn, I wouldn't say it's addiction. I would say, again, it's about, I mean, there are a variety of different presentations. Um, so with por- porn, I would say it's usually procrastination, anxiety, coping skills. Um, with, say, s- so-called sex addiction, in some cases, it's just people who are very good looking or they have money and they just want to enjoy themselves. And they're probably better off not being in a monogamous relationship because if you are a man and you have women throwing yourselves at themselves at you, this doesn't justify cheating, of course. Mm-hmm. But they, if you sit and talk to these men, they, they're they just in some cases a little bit entitled and they think they should be allowed to have sex with whoever they want. And even if they are married. So in that case, it's, it's just saying, well, maybe you're better off not being in a monogamous commitment. And is it really a problem in that case? Is it that you're addicted to sex or you just enjoy it? And the, it's a problem because you're, you've committed yourself to someone else and it's not fair to that other person. But I th- like I, when I look at, say, two years ago, there was a lot in the media about so-called sex addiction, people, mm-hmm. celebrities going off to sex addiction treatment. And I think it's just an easy way for someone to not take responsibility, as much as I feel bad saying that, to just call themselves an addict and say, well, you know, I, I have this and this is this is to blame for the choices I make. Um, in other cases, it's, as I said, you know, some people just feel really guilty about having a healthy sex drive. I think also in a lot of cases, I mean, as human beings, it's very normal to find other people attractive or to even want to have sex with other people and fantasize about other people, even if you are in a committed relationship. And I think because that makes people uncomfortable, they think that's a problem or because it makes their partner uncomfortable, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between how you feel and what you fantasize about and what you actually do. So again, I I think if you're in a committed relationship, you should not be cheating. That's not ethical. But it's very natural to want to, again, with porn, it's very natural to want to look at other people who are naked and to find that arousing. And if we could just accept that in society, I think that would take away a lot of the misconceptions around so-called porn addiction, because a lot of people feel especially if they do have any sort of guilt around those feelings that their desire to look at someone else must be a problem and that that must be pathologized. So do you think part of it's also like an impulse control issue? Like the fact that they're acting on this and knowing like I shouldn't watch porn for 12 hours a day because I need to actually go out and live and, you know, have these real life relationships and I have work and these responsibilities and the same when it comes to someone that has an alleged sex addiction, it's like, well, there's a difference between acknowledging that I'm, I find this person attractive and then acting on it, knowing that it's against the rules or parameters of your relationship. Uh, sexual compulsivity is included in the ICD, which is the International Classification of Diseases. So that's the Europe's so-called psychiatry Bible. It mm-hmm. is not 
included in the uh, DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So I just wanted to clarify because from a medical perspective, it is classified as, uh, an, as you mentioned, an impulse control disorder, but it's not classified as an addiction. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for some people, definitely. I mean, I guess you could see it from that from that perspective, but again, it's a different way of conceptualizing it and treating it from addiction because with an addiction model, you would say, okay, well, you just can't have sex. And I don't think for someone who's struggling with uh, hypersexuality that they necessarily have to stop having sex for the rest of their life. I think that they just have to find better ways of managing um, their time probably and also figuring out what is what is it they're really struggling with and then how can they can incorporate their sexuality in a healthy way. Uh, but I always just want to say that for me, I don't have, uh, because people often will say, she used to write for this magazine that had naked women in it. So of course she's going to say that. Um, but I've had these views. If you go back before I was a journalist, when I was a researcher, I had the same views. And as I said, I'm just about the data and facts. So wherever it takes us, if they do start to show that with say brain studies, that there is a, a, the reward network is changing over time as a result of this, or that, you know, that it is actually an addiction, then I'm happy to change my perspective. But I just think a lot of the, the discussion right now is really unhelpful for people who are struggling because it's not accurate. So when, so we bring it back down to um, some fMRIs and like, actual data. So what is, what's the difference between someone who might be addicted to say cocaine versus someone who's addicted to sex? So with a drug like cocaine, you will see that there will be changes in the brain over time. There will often, often be craving as well. So you'll see those parts of the brain light up, even if they're just thinking about the drug or if they see a picture of the drug. Um, we don't have any research to suggest that when it comes to pornography or sex and, and the research that we do have, because there are some studies that get a lot of attention because they are su suppo supposedly show that this is happening in the brain with um, as a response to so-called sex addiction. But when you look at how they define hypersexuality, usually it's very, very muddied that the people who take part in the study are, um, they are not very similar. So you'll have someone who say, say an addict, uh, a study looking at so-called porn addiction, mm -hmm. someone will be, someone will self-report, say there's one study that got a lot of attention and I looked at the methods and some of the people in the study would be looking at porn once a week for under an hour. And I'm thinking to me, that's not really a problem. When you look at some of the people who are looking at it for 10, 12 hours a day, that to me is a, is a problem, unfortunately. So they shouldn't be lumped together as one because mm. the results that you find are not going to really speak to either. And then the other thing I would say is also because as far as I know, no studies have looked at the, the paraphilias in that context. So if someone has a paraphilia, their brain is going to look different from someone who's not. And if you're not asking these questions as part of your methodology, again, you don't know what's going on with the people that you're scanning in the, in the brain scanner. So... Um, I think more, I'm definitely in support of more rigorous research being done. I think that's very important. I think it's excellent that we have the uh, technology and the technology continues to improve. But uh, my issue is just when people are quick to jump on a study because they think it fits a particular narrative and they run with that. And um, and because I would say also, you know, surprisingly, it's, it's pretty hostile terrain to counter anti-porn activists they are, they are, they can be very aggressive. And some people in the field have really had to deal with a lot of harassment and intimidation from them. In my you know, last conversation with you, I talk about how trans activists are bad. <laughs> Anti-porn activists are pretty bad too. I'm, I'm not sure if you had to deal, have had to deal with them, but I think that's another reason why people don't want to touch the research. Oh, that's so interesting. interesting.